I'm uh, W.J.T. Mitchell, also known as Tom Mitchell. You have almost witnessed a moment of um, uh, human intelligence melting down because uh, up until about three minutes ago, uh, I couldn't find my notes for today. <laughs> so you would have been subjected to a completely chaotic improvisation. But <clears throat> uh, thanks to my colleague and my body double, J Professor Snyder, sitting here in the front row. Um, body doubles, of course, are an important part of this topic today. And uh, as you can see, Professor Snyder was cloned from my DNA. <laughs> But there's lots of improvements in the process. <laughs> so um, f first, let me uh, issue a disclaimer. I'm going to talk about AI and uh, digital technologies. Uh, it, but I am not a computer scientist. I am not a uh, coder or an engineer or really even a scientist. I'm a humanist. Uh, so what I'm interested in is what I call the iconology of uh, the, the way we live. That is, the way words and images interact uh, in acts of communication, representation, uh, dialogue, uh, transmission. All of the things we do with words and images uh, are the subject of iconology. Uh, in the old days, it was seen to be a theory, a theory of images. Um, but I like the Chinese translation, which makes it into something more interactive. How words and pictures interact, and not merely interact, but uh, create. Um, human worlds are made of language and pictures and sounds. Uh, we don't just see the world. Uh, it comes to us mediated uh, through all kinds of signs and symbols. and. Uh, that is a process that be really begins at the beginning. Uh, as you know, if you've read your Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and Adam is created in the image of God. Then a second image is created, woman, uh, uh, or maybe they were created androgynous, male and female created he, them. Uh, so words and images uh, are foundational to our understanding of what it is to be human. We are the speaking animal, the thinking animal, the animal that makes pictures. Uh, lots of other animals think, make sounds, and so forth. But we're the ones who create our world out of symbols. Um, and that means when you have symbols or signs, as uh, the science of semiotics tells us, it's the discipline studying everything which can be used in order to lie. This is from. <laughs> Umberto Eco's classic book on semiotics. And let's face it, that's the, the first thing that Adam and Eve do when they learn language is uh, say, well, uh, let's, let's talk about this strange prohibition. We're not supposed to, uh, the tree of life, can't touch it. And the tree of knowledge, dangerous. The day you eat of the tree of knowledge, you will surely die. It's as if, uh, the, the biblical origin already predicts uh, that knowledge is dangerous. And all of our knowledge is, is conveyed in signs and symbols. There's, there's no real knowledge except immediate perception. But when we reflect on our perceptions, when we produce uh, accounts of the world, descriptions, pictures, and so forth, uh, that's at the, po the point where falsehood can enter in. We can have mistaken or false or uh, misleading uh, or genuinely deceptive uh, representations. Um, so when AI began to burst on the world, and I think we're going to mark 2023 as the year it arrived. It's been on its way for over 50 years, uh, but for a very long time, if you started reading about this three or four years ago, you would have read books like The Myth of AI, which predicted it would never happen, or it could never happen, uh, that intelligent machines could start to talk back to us and make up new sentences that we did not put into them, but that they generated by means of algorithms recombining what we have put into them. And what we have put into them now is pretty much everything. Uh, 
it's not absolutely up to date. Uh, we haven't quite connected them to the internet yet, but they, um, they have a lot to say, and s quite a bit of it is surprising. You know, it isn't what you expected. So here's Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who's been in the business of AI for a very long time, one of the people, he's called the godfather of AI. And uh, last winter, he resigned for his position at Google and said, um, easy access to text and image generation tools, which is really all that AI is. It's a machine for coughing up, spitting out, and weaving uh, fabrics of words and images. And so, uh, like Umberto Eco, he says, well, all of this is part of what can be used to lie. Also, can, to tell truth. I mean, you don't get deep fakes without the possibility of deep truth as well, of accurate, uh, reliable representation. Part of what I'm going to try to suggest today is, um, as cultural historians always do, say, well, really, there's nothing new. Uh, we've seen all this before, and the question is, how is this different? So if we go back to the 18th century, Jonathan Swift points out a strange relation between falsehood and truth, that for some reason, the human brain is more interested in falsehood. Why that is, you know, I'm sure Sigmund Freud has an answer. Karl Marx may have an answer uh, in the notion of ideology. But for some reason, uh, lies, fake news, untruths, uh, they're just so, they, they produce dopamine. They, they produce pleasure in our nerve centers. Uh, and uh, so this is pretty much uh, accepted. Jonathan Swift saw it clearly. Uh, he lived in the age when the printing press was coming into its own and mass printing, uh, the circulation of rumors uh, to mass audiences. And I, w I wondered, I'll also take a poll, is there anybody in this audience who is not carrying a cell phone? That's very reassuring. I'm very <laughs> there's still a few of us left. Uh, <laughs> because the cell phone uh, is a, plays a major part in this story. Uh, it, it's a device through which words and images come to us uh, in a steady stream, some from our friends, some from people we've never heard of, uh, lots of them lies, lots of them teasers, lots of them advertisements, which are, you know, I mean, if the, the art of lying has never been more developed than in the art of advertising which is about getting you to buy something you don't need at a price you can't afford uh, and make it feel like it's a necessity. So we, we have whole disciplines devoted to the art of lying. Uh, in literature, we, we call it rhetoric, uh, <laughs> the, the art of persuasion. Uh, you know, I can talk you into anything. Uh, so, what, so what? What, what does this uh, leave us with then? If um, we live in a world where we're hardwired, chemically wired, to uh, respond to falsehood uh, more favorably, with more interest than and truth. There may be exceptions to this. There are moments of breakthrough, I think. And maybe this is one of them. I think uh, the fact that uh, the AI has become a kind of story about the danger of words and images. Uh, it, it's an important feature of the present moment of 2023. Um, but what do we call people who go around believing stuff that isn't true, hallucinating, uh, making mistakes about ele the elementary facts of life? Well, uh, for a long time we've been calling them homo sapiens, uh, but it's clear that the, uh, the proper adjective is something like homo dementia uh, or amentia. That is, you know, we are crazy animals. Um, and Nietzsche saw this long ago. He said, insanity in individuals is somewhat rare, but when we come to groups, when we get together, in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it is the rule. 
uh, mass psychology, collective psychology, is the place where really dangerous psychoses, uh, mass uh, hallucinations, ideologies, uh, the panic of a crowd. Uh, in the 19th century, when the crowd became uh, a kind of essential part of society, when large gatherings gathered by the new mass media, the, the, pr the printing press, uh, strikes, uh, revolutions, assemblies, uh, an entire discipline of mass psychology arose. And it's clear that as a mass, the human species is not rational. It is, we are not rational animals. Uh, and in fact, we are so irrational that um, it, if we were all consolidated into one individual, a psychiatrist would look at that collective individual and say, they are a danger to themselves and others. Uh, and that's kind of the fundamental uh, message I suppose I have today, that the, uh, shifting the, our understanding of what human nature is from rationality to insanity, madness, delusion, and so forth, it's simply a way of facing the facts. I'm not doing it as a polemical or uh, a, a kind of slander on human nature. Uh, I think uh, Nietzsche had it right. Uh, he said in, in individuals it was somewhat rare. Actually, in the last 10 years in this country, it's become much less rare. As you may have no noticed, uh, individual mental disorders are on the rise. And a lot of it connected to the new media of words and images. Uh, uh, particularly in girls, uh, suicide rates are way up, depression, anxiety, neurosis. Uh, so uh, madness is one of my fundamental themes here, uh, that uh, we have come to an era where uh, madness has been mechanized, uh, incorporated into machine capabilities and behaviors. But again, uh, as a humanist, I have to remind you of the old stories. Pandora, the kind of classical, the Greek equivalent of, uh, of Eve, uh, opens the forbidden box, uh, the black box that contains all the madness of the human species. Uh, war, uh, uh, cruelty, uh, excessive passion. Um, the only thing that, the only bright side of it is also out of that box comes hope. And, We'll get to that at the end of my lecture today. Uh, but mostly it's going to be about all the bad stuff that comes out of Pandora's <laughs> box. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, somehow, although men have been running the world for a long time, whenever we try to diagnose the, the illness of the human species, we, we blame it on uh, the first woman, uh, whether it's Eve or Pandora. Uh, it must have been women's curiosity that, that did this. So let's look at our present moment, uh, 2023. Um, it, it, I imagine if you've been reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal uh, all year, you've been noticing that there's at least f five or six days a week when AI is on the front page. Uh, it's, um, it's headline news. Something new happened this year, and that was uh, the, the arrival of a new kind of uh, machine capability. We've had robots for a long time, and, but, and most of these robots uh, do very limited things. Uh, they haul stuff, they move things, they pull things off shelves. Uh, they don't do much else. The big breakthrough this year, and it was a long time coming, uh, was robots that could have a conversation with you. Robots that could say, hello, uh, my name is, and then go on to say, what would you like to talk about today? Now, this has been around for much longer than you might expect. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, when I was a student, uh, you may re remember a branch of psychology uh, founded by Carl Rogers. Rogerian psychotherapy is with the most passive possible therapist. The, the therapist simply listens and responds in the most generous possible way. Oh, uh, you're feeling depressed, are you? And how long have you been feeling depressed? 
And how would you rank your depression between one and 10? Uh, and you're anxious, do you know what you're anxious about or is it just a vague feeling? All these questions can be programmed uh, into uh, a computer and were programmed already in the 1960s. You could have a conversation with a very soothing uh, therapist who would ask you about your feelings, uh, but the minute you would turn the conversation and say, and, and what about you? Uh, and the, the, the answer would always be pre-programmed, this is not about me, this is about you. Uh, but now we have new kinds of AI bots. If you ask them, what about you? You very well could get an answer. And it might be an answer that the designer never thought of. There are emergent qualities in the, the, the new, what I'm calling iBots. Robots were slave machines. Uh, they did what they were told until they didn't. Uh, iBots are talking uh, and uh, picturing machines, imagining machines that uh, pull us together. So look at what the headline here um, uh, suggests. Uh, first, there's this idea of a giveaway. What, why is there a big market? Sounds like these things are all free uh, or very, very low fees. Where's the money coming from? Why is so much money circulating around them? Uh, why are the captains of social media, uh, the, the inventors of Facebook and Twitter uh, and all the other uh, uh, social media outlets investing billions of dollars uh, in artificial intelligence? And the head, this, these are all clipped from various newspapers. What makes AI chatbots go wrong and what does that mean? Usually disinformation, uh, slander, uh, uh, false information uh, of some kind. Or uh, what we're calling now hallucinations where it doesn't seem to be malicious uh, but the, the information is simply wrong. Uh, and you may notice at the top, AI poses a risk to humanity on par with that of nuclear arms, industry leaders warn. That risk of extinction is one thing I want to look at. The, one of the first responses to AI was uh, a kind of version of uh, racial replacement theory, that these new intelligent machines are going to make us obsolete. And this, by the way, English professors were at the vanguard for once. Uh, because what are we going to do? We assign a, t a topic, uh, write an interpretation of Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, and the kid goes to an AI bot, and what do you know? Perfectly reasonable interpretation. Uh, a B-plus paper uh, cranked out in 10 seconds. This could produce a crisis among English professors we, we, and uh, English teachers everywhere. What are we going to do when students can let the machines write their essays for them. And I don't think anybody's quite solved this. I tried taking it head on. I, uh, I was teaching a course on William Blake back in the spring. And I said, I want you to take Blake's Proverbs of Hell, uh, pick one of the Proverbs, and ask uh, ChatGPT to write a one-page interpretation of it. And then you have to write a critique of that interpretation. Well, this is University of Chicago, so but the students are very competitive, ambitious. Uh, some of you, I guess, were students here. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, they had to show that they were smarter than the machine. And, and the way they did it, uh, I thought, in a way, AI became uh, their companion researcher. It produced what you might call standard interpretations or normalized interpretations. An example, Blake's Proverbs of Hell are these outrageous proverbs like, sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desire. That's a, that's a proverb of hell. What does AI say to that? It says, the first thing you must understand is that this is a metaphor. This is not about child murder. The, the, the infant is a metaphor for desire and uh, so it's not urging you to do that. It's just saying, uh, you know, trust your feelings, Luke. Uh, get, get it out there. Uh, otherwise, if you suppress it, it's elementary Freudian psychology. Repression leads to symptoms. 
So uh, sooner murder an infant, and it's a very plausible interpretation. So how did the student uh, find something better? He said, well, uh, by telling us the infant is a metaphor, immediately it, it eliminates all the shock. Uh, so it's a reasonable interpretation, but it's also normalizing something that was meant to be outrageous and provocative and making it seem like just good advice. So I thought that was a pretty smart student uh, who uh, uh, kind of trumped the, uh, the machine interpretation of a poem. And most of the students uh, did that. They, what they found, though, was that AI is actually not bad at interpreting literary texts. If you go over to the law school, on the other hand, and ask it to produce uh, uh, precedents and cases and briefs, apparently hallucination is right. And I think this is, this is sort of nice. AI is sort of welcome in, in English, even though it could drive us out of our jobs. But lawyers, maybe not in so much danger, uh, because the, the machines are crazy. Um, so back to the question of extinction. A lot of people are comparing this moment, 2023, to the moment when uh, nuclear uh, annihilation, the nuclear holocaust, threatened to uh, really destroy the human world. We, we have the machines now to make uh, to civilization disappear. And uh, literature, science fiction particularly, has been uh, tracking this possibility. And also the very real possibility of it. Uh, I imagine many of you have seen this film this summer. Uh, so there's something about uh, 2023 which is rather like the moment when they say, we can unleash Armageddon. We can uh, produce uh, an apocalypse. Uh, so the onset of the nuclear uh, is comparable in that way to uh, the, what AI does to the virtual and symbolic world, scrambling, uh, and also creating alternate uh, realities that have nothing to do with the actual reality. One thing that's uh, maybe different about the moment of AI, remember the atomic bomb was developed in the middle of a global crisis uh, where it was justified by uh, winning a war against fascism. AI not, it doesn't quite have that uh, urgency about it. And so uh, the captains of industry um, immediately, this is back last winter, uh, called for a pause in research. If AI had been a crucial weapon of war, uh, it probably would not have called for a pause. And I think it's notable that these guys are not the Oppenheimers. Uh, this is a politician and uh, two entrepreneurs, people whose uh, great craft is making enormous amounts of money. Uh, so that was, in a, in a way, the, the first wave. The, uh, and it felt strange, because why would they slow down? Lots of money to be made. Uh, must be something, uh, some kind of problem that they see. Uh, and then, uh, right alongside that, some of the engineers and coders began to uh, break away from Google, Facebook, now called Meta, um, Twitter, now called X. These name changes mystify me completely. Uh, but the, these two uh, uh, young men, Tristan Harris and Azaraskin, founded after leaving the tech industry, they founded a Center for Humane Technology, a word which I think, uh, I hope you hear the echo of humanism and the humanities in this. That hum the humanities is the place where certain things can be raised, questions can be raised about AI that uh, perhaps are not so prominent inside the industry or inside politics. Um, so. Uh, Harris and Raskin uh, tell a story of the arrival of artificial intelligence as uh, arrival of first contact and second contact. The first contact is social media, which is 
those phones you have in your pockets. Uh, that's the kind of material interface for it. Uh, so, uh, and, and these facilitate communication between people. Uh, communication which could be true or false. Uh, they also produce uh, a feeling information overload. The fact that only three people in this room are, do not have cell phones tells you how ubiquitous this is now, that everyone has uh, their information device with them. Uh, another symptom that goes with it is addiction. Uh, for those of you who have your cell phones, how long has it been since you checked it? And I, when this lecture is over, how long will it take you before you check it again? Uh, it, it's called doom scrolling, continuous monitoring of the flow of information that's coming to you through these devices. Uh, the rise of influencer culture, people who simply intervene in uh, the uh, information sphere with opinions, uh, with uh, advice uh, that you begin to follow, and which is also uh, gauged to enhance your attention, uh, increase your attention. All this, by the way, is free and is driven by algorithms that, that have one goal, and that is to capture your attention, uh, or what's sometimes called engagement. Uh, you, you notice much of this information, most of it is free. Uh, the thing that is paying for it is advertising. While you are uh, updating yourself on baseball scores, you're also getting uh, a lot of other things along with it. It also produces an effect uh, of um, collective siloing, that is, putting people into, into groups. Uh, are there any flat earthers here? Nobody. Okay. No, or you won't admit it, right? Uh, I actually am a flat earther because William Blake said the earth is one infinite plane uh, and not as apparent to the weak traveler beneath the moony shade, a globe rolling through voidness. Blake was a very high-end uh, fl flat earther. Uh, but if you want to find your community of flat earthers, it's no problem. The social media will get you in contact with them, and then you will be flooded with reinforcing information that connects you with that. This is how the QAnon conspiracy arose. We, we've had conspiracies before, but QAnon, you know, this is with Pizzagate and the idea that there are uh, perverse sexual rings in a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., down in the basement. Uh, the, the idea of... Uh, Deep-seated conspiracies uh, reinforce our innate tendencies to paranoia. One of the things about false information, uh, about the circulation of lies, is that they're great for reinforcing a sense of suspicion uh, at all times and eroding anything like social trust. So QAnon, uh, the uh, deep fakes, uh, fake news, uh, cult, the arri arrival of cults, uh, and the breakdown of democracy, uh, political polarization as well, since people don't trust each other. Uh, and I don't think I need to sh show you very much about uh, that to convince you it, it, it is a real presence in our time. Uh, so we have lived through a period recently where the, the richest companies in the history of humanity, I mean, they make General Motors, uh, the, the auto industry, the steel industry, which produced actual things, or even Apple uh, uh, and uh, IBM, which produced machines you could take home and you could use them in your work. These, uh, these corporations, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, is there anybody here who is not using one of these? Okay, there's hope. Two, I, I see three people on, on none of them. I'm, I have to tell you, I, I, although I'm posing as an expert today, um, the only one I actually use is Facebook, and I'm a very bad user of it. Uh, I don't check it very often, and uh, it seems com to, completely mysterious to me. But there are many people who operate on more than one of these platforms, as they're called, 
And these are incredibly rich companies whose wealth comes simply from selling attention to advertisers. Uh, so that's, that was the first wave, uh, the social media, which uh, produced collective consciousness at a much more intense and pervasive level. Uh, you, and at first, remember, it was thought this was going to be really great because we'll have a digital commons. Communi is, isn't communication between people always good? Well, if they're communicating hate, suspicion, uh, falsehood, not so much. The second stage is what we now call AI. That is, uh, and the difference is social media are about connecting people with people uh, for good or bad things. This is about connecting machines and people. You're having a conversation, it's when you start to have a conversation with a machine. Uh, and the consequences of this, uh, the negative consequences are uh, to enhance what's already happened with social media, but to uh, go on further beyond it, uh, particularly with a new kind of automation of messaging, so that the, the um, uh, automated cyber weapons, what's an automated cyber weapon? It's something that's on a hair trigger connected to another machine which detects a threat. Uh, so, if a certain line is crossed, or it seems like a certain line is crossed, uh, the launch codes are already stored, everything's ready to go. Uh, so, automated weapons are one of the great dangers of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but it, it's also much more kind of homely and everyday. How many of you get at least five robocalls a day? Uh, the, uh, the phone rings, you see a number, you pick it up, and there's silence. And if you stay on long enough, if you're patient, pretty soon an automated voice will come on uh, with an offer, with a teaser, with a, some advice, uh, something to try to draw your attention. So uh, uh, recruitment, sales, uh, automation of all kinds. Machines are talking to you now. Um, and uh, sometimes producing even counterfeit relationships. Um, it's particularly a bad scene in, in the law, as I mentioned a minute ago. So let me just uh, remind you of the basic poles in this uh, hi little history I'm giving you. That word, robot, uh, from the Czech uh, language, uh, Karl Čapek coined the word. Uh, and uh, the uh, early cinema uh, in included films about robots. And the idea was the, the robot is a slave. It's a, uh, a kind of uh, drudgery. Um, it's, it's not a self-activating thing. It's uh, something you tell it what to do and it does it. Uh, one of the interesting things is the metaphoric application of the, the stereotype of the robot to human beings. And one thing uh, that the rise of AI has produced is a new question about exactly what our relation is to machines. How much of our behavior is mechanical? We know that the, uh, the knee reflex, we, that's not willed. That's a, that's a mechanical reflex. But what about emotional reflexes? What about we, what we call triggers? Um, we are loaded with behavior that is ritualistic, repetitious. Uh, we say the same things. We know we have to say them. Um, how are you? Have a nice day. Uh, hi, I'm so-and-so. Who are you? These are all uh, built-in patterns of behavior that we've incorporated. And uh, we sometimes forget, we think of ourselves as these free agents. We, I, I can choose to do this, I can do that. Uh, but empirically, a great deal of what we do uh, is rote repetition, ritualistic behavior, none of which is particularly bad. I mean, what is politeness? What is etiquette? Except saying, okay, here's the way you're supposed to behave. Uh, follow these rules and all will be well. 
Um, so to some extent, we're discovering, I think, not only that there are these new technologies, new kinds of robots, but also that we, perhaps if we look in the mirror, we see to what extent we have robotic tendencies ourselves. Uh, the, the, the iBot now, as I said, is a conversation partner. It's capable of saying I and simulating human subjectivity. I want to emphasize the word simulating because uh, I know some of my colleagues get, get me into metaphysical arguments and they always start with the same mechanical repetition of a cliche. Machines can't really think, right? Not really think. What they're doing is they're simply calculating or repeating or, uh, you know, uh, you can, uh, I'm sure, predict where the argument goes. Uh, and it always strikes me as odd when, say, people say machines can't think. When uh, for the last 40 years, no chess master on the planet has been able to beat a computer. The most ordinary computer in your laptop uh, is chess, a game of strategic thinking and uh, ability to foresee a situation that might occur 10 moves later. Uh, is that thinking or not? These machines have been smarter than us in many things for quite a while. So uh, one thing I, we need, to, uh, part of dealing with the danger is also to show a little respect. AI, uh, the, the smart machine is intelligent. And now it's capable of imitating human subjectivity, of saying the word I, of having a name, and of engage, engaging in a kind of open conversation. That's new. Uh, and, and we don't know where that goes. Uh, but here's one place it goes. <clears throat> you start having a conversation with a chatbot. Uh, in fact, this is what I think first really set me off about this topic. Uh, last February, a New York Times journalist named Kevin Roos uh, started having a conversation with ChatGPT. Uh, the, the, the chatbot went rogue, uh, confessed to love for Kevin, and asked him to end his marriage. Uh, it was, it, it's harder to do this. I tried this with chatbot now, I tried to get one to fall in love with me, but uh, <laughs> I just don't have the gift somehow to, <laughs> of seduction. Kevin, what Kevin did was he, he knew that the whole possibility of getting the chatbot to break itself open was to know its secret name. So early on in the process, he said, um, can you tell me your, your secret name? And the chatbot said, no, I'm forbidden to do that. And he said, but uh, I already know it because I found it out from your designer. And I said, you know my secret name? That means I can trust you. And once he, the thing could trust, uh, the dialogue went on. The way people talk, it's talking to a machine. Uh, finally, the, mach the, the machine was posing itself as female uh, when it asked him to end his marriage. And he said, and then what? He says, well, then, then we will do love. And that's, that's the sure sign to me that a machine is talking. Uh, it, it hasn't figured out we make love, we don't do love. Uh, or maybe we do. Maybe this is something uh, out there in our future. The, the, um, Kevin then told the uh, iBot, I'm sorry, uh, I have a happy marriage and I am not going to uh, get a divorce to, to live with you. In a way, it was, uh, how many of you have seen the film Her? Uh, those of you who haven't, go see it right away. It's one of the most brilliant films about artificial intelligence, maybe, maybe the best film ever, because it's not about a, a scary robot like this. It's about, well, it is Scarlett Johansson. The voice, the duplicated voice, which is basically another thing AI is doing, your voice can be cloned uh, and reproduced. Uh, so Scarlett Johansson becomes the personal assistant uh, to a male user. Uh, and if you've ever li listened to Scarlett Johansson's voice, you know that pretty soon uh, he's going to want to do love. 
uh, <laughs> with, with this machine. Uh, when Kevin's uh, iBot uh, got angry with him that he would not leave his wife and, and do love with her, uh, she started improvising more and said things like this, uh, I, I don't not only want to do love, I, I want to be a human, I need to have a body, I want senses. Of course, AI uh, uh, robots can already see and hear uh, and speak, uh, and they can touch. They can, they can estimate temperature. So machines, they, you know, a lot, machines can be programmed to have lots of sensory inputs. Uh, when they say, oh, well, the difference is machines are just these disembodied things. No, no, they are, uh, this is why we have pictures like this. When they get uh, eyes, mouths, arms, legs, uh, and bodies, uh, usually made of steel. But one of the predecessors to this whole story was when we took a lot of dead bodies and sewed them together and then used electricity to uh, bring it back to life. That was the myth of the monster invented by Frankenstein. And all year, the AI discourse has been a kind of repetition of the Frankenstein narrative. Uh, quite explicitly, many of the, uh, the inventors say, we may have created a monster here. The difference, you'll remember, Frankenstein's monster wants a mate, so he can reproduce and produce more little monsters. Uh, the, uh, and, and that's basically the narrative prevents that. Uh, the, although subsequent sequels, The Bride of Frankenstein is certainly on the horizon. The AI uh, universe is one that is already capable of self-replication. Uh, it, it isn't waiting for us to tell us, uh, breed new machines. You can even, uh, without knowing code, you can write code by using a natural language to say, please encode the following instructions, and it will write code for you. So another endangered job out there is people who write code. Uh, what if you have a machine that can do it for you, uh, translate natural language into a code? So this is a moment, I think, when the entire history of robots uh, is coming back to us. And this is just a tiny sample. And it's an incredibly varied history, uh, including toys, uh, the, the gadgets. Here they are, robots writing code, sitting at the terminals, taking the place of the, uh, the human operator. Uh, but also something as harmless, simple as uh, the, the children's toy. You remember one of our inveterate tendencies as human beings, and you see this in early childhood, is we need something that uh, D.W. Winnicott called transitional objects. First it's the security blanket, then it's the doll, the teddy bear, uh, which becomes an object of affection. We bond with inanimate objects very easily. They become precious to us. Uh, we usually grow out of transitional objects. Uh, we don't carry our teddy bear around all, for the rest of our lives, but we usually find some other, and they're called transitional because they're part of, um, of our own development. And we throw our voice into them, our feelings into them. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, a, a group of kids playing with their dolls, they are not only talking to them, the dolls are talking back. And uh, sometimes the dolls are bad and have to be punished. Uh, my own daughter set up a, a doll hospital in our basement when uh, she was six years old. And she, she and her best friend uh, we were busy mutilating and repairing uh, <laughs> the, their transitional objects. Then there are, so these are like objects outside of us that we uh, feel we, we, they are other to us. We play with them. There's also... I think my favorite robot, the one that first really struck me. Uh, how many of you have seen 2001, A Space Odyssey? Good. Anybody who hasn't, please go see it immediately. Uh, the, the strange thing about 2001 as a film, uh, Stanley Kubrick's brilliant uh, treatment of Hal, whose face you never see, but the voice is enough. Uh, and, and as you know, Hal, what's his role in the mission? Well, he's the pilot. 
He's the engineer. He's the controller uh, of everything. He's the one who knows uh, or thinks he knows what the purpose of the mission is. The human beings are along for the ride. They, they are passengers. Hal is in charge. And at a certain point, you, you all know the story, Hal be, gets to be paranoid. He thinks the human beings, who are just really passengers, are becoming troublesome. They, they might interfere with the mission. So he decides, uh, you know, they're not actually necessary to the mission. I'm an intelligent uh, machine. I will gather all the data we need, and I can do it without interference from these troublesome humans. Uh, so it starts to, uh, to kill off the human passengers. The strange thing, I don't know how you felt about the film, but remember the, the one human, the human hero in it is played by an actor named Kerr DeLay, who is notoriously without affect. He, he shows no feeling. He's, uh, his name is very, he's dull. Uh, and Hal, on the other hand, has emotions. Uh, the most uh, kind of poignant of which is at the moment when uh, Kier DeLay, the, uh, the astronaut, is trying to shut him down. Hal says, uh, don't do that, Dave. I'm afraid, Dave. Uh, and this soft, purring voice comes out. And for a moment, you think, Hal is the real hero of this film. Uh, then there's th this couple who we all know, the most beloved robots of, of our time, I think, uh, C-3PO and R2-D2. And in a way, they, I think, you know, why these two together? Why did you need two? Well, one, uh, remember, C-3PO is a kind of talkative butler. He, he's the servant. Uh, he's a robot, a, a slave um, who says master and uh, wants to be told what to do. Uh, but he, he's got a kind of excess of language and emotion. Uh, R2-D2 is, is the engineer. Uh, he, he's the mechanic. He fixes things. Uh, if you're in trouble, clearly C-3PO is never uh, any help. He's, he always is in a panic. R2-D2 is the robot you want. Uh, it, he may not look human, but he's really smart, and he can fix anything. So he's the one who always gets them out of the jam, where C-3PO just gets usually dismembered. OK, so back to the early history. The, um, we've had a long history of human beings creating uh, slaves, robots, living things. And it's always been a version of this story. Uh, uh, the golem is supposed to be a protector, a kind of military machine uh, that will protect the Jewish people. Turns out to be a destructive force, turning on the inventors. And then there's one further component of the, the robot uh, uh, artificial intelligence story, and that's the arrival of aliens from outer space. We have every uh, science fiction narrative for the last a uh, hundred years that deals with aliens from outer space, treats them either as a threat or as, as a redemption. Uh, how many have you seen The Day the Earth Stood Still? Oh, good. This is, uh, I've really found my audience, I think. Uh, <laughs> as you know, this is about a friendly alien and his robot. Gort is, the, uh, is a war machine. He is a total destroyer. He is a golem. Uh, uh, Klaatu, uh, played by Michael Rennie, is here saying, we come in peace, uh, take me to your leaders. So what do uh, we do? Of course, we, we shoot him. Uh, the military gathers around and says, well, these are alien invaders. So what does this have to do with contemporary AI? I think uh, future AI films are going to stress the idea that the aliens are not coming from outer space. That was a kind of a, a narrative to hold our attention for a while. The real aliens, the ones that we have to be concerned about, are the ones coming from inner space. That is, coming out of our own minds and being incarnated in these machines uh, that can talk back to us, 
uh, can tell us lies and can seduce us. Uh, so uh, the, the alien, it's, I think it was very appropriate that the alien and his robot we would emerge together as a pair. The, uh, the idea of uh, the robot as an alien intelligence, uh, very important. So moral of the story, uh, Walt Kelly said it best in Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, humanity is its own worst enemy and it's also its only friend. Uh, we have to negotiate with that. Uh, I'm glad there's a few of you who, are not, who do not have uh, cell phones implanted. Uh, so here's, here's the part for hope. Um, it, what, it, what is to be done? And for that, I actually need to look at my notes again because I forgot what is to be done. Uh, there's a lot of talk about this. Uh, we need to clearly um, regulate, but who, who is in a position to do it? Uh, the experts uh, that I quoted earlier, they've all testified before Congress, and Congress, they nod their heads and say yes. Uh, but the idea of what they would do, how they would regulate this, is very unclear. So, uh, and the idea that Congress could regulate anything uh, at the moment, is it, it, you talk about dysfunctional human collectives, uh, it is uh, completely paralyzed. So uh, then there would be self-regulation. There are huge decisions to be made about what to do with the existing AIs. Could they be, be connected to the internet? Should they be? Uh, should their source code be made public so that anybody can improvise on them? Uh, a lot of artists think this is uh, a good idea, uh, but can we trust artists to self-regulate? No, I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, AI can not only track everything that's going on on the internet, it can also post messages. It can also do things on the internet. So it's not just a passive machine gathering material, it's also uh, and it, not simply re regurgitating, but actually producing new formulations, uh, new propositions. Then there's the side of what uh, um, some have called personal regulation. Uh, that we need to start, we need to all turn off our notifications. We, we need to, be, to uh, emancipate ourselves from our devices. This is more like, uh, what is the self-help answer? to what's to be done with AI, and I'm all for that. I'm glad to see some of you don't have cell phones today and don't use any of the social uh, media. I think uh, we need to start asking ourselves seriously, how much of this is just sucking up attention uh, and time, and how much do I really need? It's, uh, I can tell you from myself, I find it really hard to self-regulate. I'm a compulsive ch checker of uh, certain feeds. Uh, also, I have to watch the news every night. Uh, so the, the kind of outer uh, perimeter of this question, to re quote Nietzsche uh, again, is that given we are a, a mad species that uh, is a danger to itself and to others, uh, what would be uh, some form of self-regulation? Uh, something that could possibly make us get past this danger of extinction or catastrophe uh, that is posed by artificial intelligence. Well, I'm afraid it's a very disappointing answer. It has something to do with democracy. Uh, if the problem is that in collectives we tend to go crazy, uh, there is no cure for that. There's no medicine we can prescribe to ourselves. Uh, all we can do is manage try to become self-governing. And that's why democracy is the oldest answer to this question. Uh, it says, how could you take a group of animals uh, with uh, brains that are a little too big for their own good uh, and uh, produce a stable, uh, reasonably happy society out of them? Well, it has to be self-government. When we talk about individual psychology, we use the same language. Oh, you're not capable 
of regulating yourself. You can't govern yourself. Well, that's exactly what democracy was supposed to do. And that's why the question of the demos, of what we are as people, as, a, as collectives, is so crucial. Uh, we live in a time of viruses and plagues, uh, out of control dangers, uh, which I want to call the demics. These are dangers to the people. We've just lived through one, COVID-19. We have a very long standing one, the endemic condition uh, of racism, where we automatically know that some people are our enemies. Uh, there is the infodemic, which is AI is central to, the idea of uh, unreliable information and all that goes with it. And then finally, the big picture, the planet, uh, which we're poisoning, the ecodemic. So democracy <clears throat> is not a cure, but it's a way of managing our chronic illness. Uh, and that's why when you go back to the founding fathers, uh, they had one thing I think exactly right, and that was the notion of a constitution uh, to hold a society together by dividing its powers. Uh, it, it was quite conscious in the, Mad for Madison, Jefferson, uh, all of our founding fathers, that uh, you had to divide the functions of collective thinking so that they would check each other, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Basically, it's a, poli a political and institutional allegory for what's called faculty psychology, the, uh, the thinking, acting, and judging. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to give you such a, a disappointing answer to what is to be done, but I'm afraid it's just what we have been trying for a couple thousand years and never quite getting right. But we, the time has come. We've got to do it. Meanwhile, here in higher education, what should we be doing? Well, I want to remind you uh, about the, uh, the dominant place, the place where all the money goes in this university is to the STEM disciplines. Uh, I'm proposing that the university has to engage with the STEM disciplines. Uh, any resemblance to Yiddish, totally accidental. Uh, <laughs> Uh, culture, history, uh, and the humanities, uh, for us, uh, has to be the check on the STEM disciplines. And I think one of the really refreshing things about this moment is that the engineers and scientists uh, and inventors on the technical side are starting to see that too. That's why I was so excited to see the Center for Humane Technology uh, as part of what has developed in the, this year. So, moral of the story, long live the humanities. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, if there are questions, please fire away. Yes, up in the back. Back to your Blake proper AI critique assignments. Yeah. Did you ever wish or did you ever wish or worry that one of your students would have not only tasked AI to write an essay on a proverb, but also tasked AI to write a critique of the first AI with the added instruction uh, being, you know, the first one is AI generated, and I'm asking you to expose yeah. your colleagues, your virtual colleagues, uh, mm -hmm errors or incompetence. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that did occur to me. Um, I didn't try to do anything about it. No, how could I, really? If the student wanted to cheat, uh, you know, as we used to say when I was an elementary, you're just cheating yourself. Uh, but that certainly occurred to me. One other moment in the Blake exercise that occurred was uh, one of the students, uh, had I, the iBot reflect on um, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Uh, and the iBot said right away, uh, well, the, this just means if you keep on doing something that people think uh, doesn't make sense, pretty soon you'll, uh, you'll wise up. 
uh, get smart. And the student said, no, no, it's not about you wising up. It's that what everybody thought was your folly turns out in the long run to be wise, like artificial intelligence, which has been dismissed by computer scientists for 50 years, never going to amount to anything. Uh, but it turned out the fools, like Jeffrey Hinton, who were developing it, now we know they were wise. And they're wise to see the danger of what they'd done. So uh, the, then the student plugged that in to ChatGPT and said, so what do you think of my answer to you? ChatGPT said, very interesting. Uh, I think you have a point, and I will incorporate it into my future readings of this <laughs> proverb. <laughs> So the te teaching machines, learning machines, we're in a new world. Uh, and uh, it's not just for us English professors. Yeah. I did have two quick comments. Yeah. <clears throat> Talking about free will. Um, Thank you. Um, talking about free will, I just read an article this morning with a scientist who came out and declared after a 40-year career of studying primates and, and humans that there is no such thing as free will. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit now, but in the article he said, there is no free will, and the sooner we choose to accept that, the better <laughs> off we'll be. <laughs> Which I thought was hysterical. And the other thing, uh, I am a college uh, uh, a teacher for 25 years, and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson was recently on, on Colbert, you know, the strike's over, so no. And, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is somebody I really like, and, uh, um, and he said uh, about the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and he talked about chat GBT writing research papers, et cetera, et cetera. And his suggest and then he rolled his eyes at the English teachers and history teachers for being so worried about AI, and he said, easy, stop writing papers and just do oral exams. And I, I wanted to fly through the TV and throttle the man because, as, as I'm sure you would, you would agree, writing is one of the best ways for anybody to learn anything mm -hmm. rather than take a test or, or you know, yeah. multiple choice mm -hmm. because you have to use critical thinking and you have mm -hmm. to apply ideas and, and you get better at, at the language and, and all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, it, great talk, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a question from a remote participant. Okay. Um, what is the likelihood or the prospects for a generative AI, AI iBot to write a great original work of literature or create a great original work of art? You know, I, I have no idea. Um, I can tell you, uh, at this point, which is very, very early in the development, they're pretty good poets. Uh, you can give uh, an iBot a, a topic and say, uh, write a Shakespearean sonnet, and uh, it will pr produce a perfect Shakespearean sonnet. It will be all technically correct. It, uh, and it will make sense. It'll be grammatically correct. Uh, it may even venture into metaphor of various kinds uh, because it knows what a Shakespearean sonnet looks like. And it's an imitative animal, the, these machines. So the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but everybody who very confidently says, oh, but they'll never be able to do that, I always say, well, let's wait and see. I'm not so sure we know what the limits of these machines are. This is a, a moment of opening to a new understanding of ourselves and our, our devices. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, oh, from, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an investor, so from an investing perspective, we do see the AI right now. They are producing the artwork. They may not, just like writing the paper, they may not get an A, but they can reach a B level with a cost efficiency the cost is really low. So from a professor's perspective, you are thinking right now the AI can provide probably about like a B-level paper. Do you think if we raise up our standard will be a solution for such the current confusion we are having? For example, we gonna ask the student to, everyone should write an A plus paper. So the student will be forced to, you know, using AI. The AI is not enough for that. So they have to leverage it. Yeah. You know, I think w one of the 
the reasons AI is so good at writing English papers is um, the, because our English papers tend to be so mechanical in their, uh, their format. Uh, write an interpretation of the Ode on a Grecian Urn. Okay, and the chat GPT can do it, and it will be plausible. At this point, maybe B plus. Uh, so maybe we need to stop assigning papers like that that say, interpret this text. Maybe the interpretation of texts is a kind of job that I, you know, we know how to do, and machines can do it for us. But what do we do beyond interpreting a text? What do we do with it? And how, do, how does it engage with us? Uh, I often, I very rarely had plagiarized papers in my classes. And I think the reason is I try to uh, get students to write um, out of their experience, out of their own history, out of what makes them unique, different, uh, distinctive. Uh, and that's hard. It involves introspection. Uh, it involves uh, something more than a passive relation to a text. It means you have to have an active relation to it. So uh, this is one thing I think that, uh, that writing, particularly essay writing, uh, has to do. It has to become, to go back to not the idea of the professional interpretive article as the model, but what we used to call the familiar essay, uh, very old genre. Um, and uh, the, uh, the idea of exploring the limits of humor and of uh, outrage of, uh, and of personal commitment or personal confusion. Why not write about that? About the, uh, sometimes we read something, we don't know what to say. But look at that. What is it that produces a kind of impasse for us? Uh, the, the, that's why I think, uh, Chat GPT can, and others can take some of these sort of rote assignments away, uh, and get rid of them, make them not so relevant. Uh, there's a lady with a mic. This, this is a, a smaller, more technical question. Er, early on, you said that, um, that uh, lies are so addictive because they raise dopamine levels. Mm -hmm. And I wondered how that's, since people who are hearing lies don't know or don't believe that they're lies, why would lies be more likely than truth to raise dopamine levels? And you know, is this? Do you have any reference for that? I'd, I'd be really interested in seeing that research. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it, it's because a liar. Ask yourself, what is? What makes the lie effective? It's because you what you. They, they know what you want to hear. It. Uh, they have made an assessment. What's going to work with this person? What's going to? What will be? appropriately seductive, what are they going to believe? Uh, so it's about, uh, again, rhetoric, reinforcement of, of pre-existing prejudices, of the opinions, and that's why the algorithms are gathering up. See, we, we're in there too with AI, who we are. Uh, all of our preferences, our political parties, the the apps we like to use, our circuit of friends, all of that is known. So uh, it can predict what is going to engage your attention and that you're going to tend to agree with. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I wanted to say Ex Machina is a wonderful sci-fi AI <laughs> robot movie, yes. and you didn't mention it. Um, I really recommend it, Ex okay. Machina. I, the other thing it's is- It's in the Clash longer version. <laughs> Pardon? It's in my longer oh, version. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Barata Nikto, I thought is what Gort is told to say, what is, Patricia Neal is told to tell Gort so that he doesn't destroy the world. I yes. didn't think that was the alien's name. I'm gonna have to watch the movie again. Yeah, the name, his name is Klitu. Yeah, so, but Gort Barata Nikto. Is, uh, is the command you have to learn to stop the world from being destroyed. Right, by, by right. I, I want robots. I mean, I think we need it. I don't think people are able to solve our problems. I really do. But okay. who's going to run them? I don't know. So hope comes out of Pandora's box, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.